Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai. Hello citizens of the internet. Today I am going to talk to you about diagnosis and management of pelvic inflammatory disease. This is part 2 of my e-lecture on PID. For better understanding of the topic, please watch part 1 first. I will first discuss the diagnosis of PID. The classic patient at high risk for pelvic inflammatory disease is a menstruating woman younger than 25 years who has multiple sexual partners, does not use contraception and lives in an area with high prevalence of sexually transmitted infections. Depending on the severity of infection, patients may be minimally symptomatic, what is called subclinical pelvic inflammatory disease or may present with severe symptoms. Gonococcal PID is thought to have an abrupt onset with more toxic symptoms as compared to chlamydial salpingitis which is more silent. The characteristic and diagnostic feature of pelvic inflammatory disease is lower abdominal pain. The pain is typically described as diffuse bilateral constant dull aching or cramping. It begins few days after onset of menstrual period and tends to be accentuated by motion, exercise or coitus. Pain from PID usually lasts less than 7 days. If the pain lasts longer than 3 weeks, the likelihood that PID is the correct diagnosis declines substantially. Abnormal vaginal discharge is present in approximately 75% of cases. It is mucopurulent as it comes from cervicitis. Unanticipated vaginal bleeding often postcoital is reported in about 40% of cases. Dyspareunia is another symptom. Fever, nausea and vomiting manifest late in the clinical course of the disease. And now a clinical pearl. If a woman who is not sexually active develops symptoms of PID, think of mycobacterial tuberculosis as the cause of the infection. Because of the potential serious complications of untreated PID and the endemic prevalence of the infection, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has adopted an approach designed to maximize diagnosis by using minimal criteria. The CDC also urges clinicians to maintain a low threshold for diagnosis and empiric treatment. One or more of the following minimal clinical criteria suggests diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease. Cervical motion tenderness also known as chandelier sign, uterine tenderness and adnexal tenderness. Presence of mucopurulent discharge due to cervicitis enhances the specificity of the minimum criteria on per abdominal examination rebound lower abdominal tenderness and involuntary guarding suggests peritonitis right upper quadrant tenderness or palpable rub suggests peripatetic adhesions since no single laboratory test is highly specific or sensitive for the disease laparoscopy is the current gold standard for the diagnosis of acute pelvic inflammatory disease it should be noted however that some experts believe that laparoscopy should not be done for acute cases of clinically suspected pelvic inflammatory disease as it may cause flare up or dissemination of the disease the minimum criteria for diagnosing pid laparoscopically include tubal wall edema visible hyperemia of the tubal surface and the presence of exudate on tubal surfaces and femoria other investigations done to support the diagnosis include wbc count esr c reactive protein chlamydial and gonococcal dna probes and cultures urine analysis to rule out urinary tract infection and pregnancy tests or serum beta hcg levels to rule out ectopic pregnancy Imaging studies such as ultrasonography, hysterosalpingography, 
CT scan and MRI may be helpful in unclear cases. First, I will talk about the role of transvaginal sonography in the diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease. Sonographic findings suggestive of endometritis are indistinct endometrial borders, thickened endometrium, and heterogeneity of endometrium. Findings suggestive of a pyosalpings are debris in the tube, echoless fallopian tube, and thickened tube greater than 5 mm. In the presence of a tubo over an abscess, on ultrasonography, there will be multiple internal echoes in the tubes and ovaries and thickened walls. USG findings of a hydrosalpings are presence of an anechoic tubular structure in the adnexa, which is fluid filled. Sonographic findings suggestive of oophoritis are enlarged ovaries, ill defined margins, free fluid in the pouch of Douglas, and presence of multiple ovarian cysts. Transvaginal sonography has some advantages. Besides being a non invasive investigation, it helps to rule out the following conditions which are differential diagnosis of PID. Ectopic pregnancy, hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, ovarian torsion, and ovarian endometrioma. Hysterosalpingography is a useful imaging technique for diagnosis of chronic pelvic inflammatory disease conditions like hydrosalpings as shown here. Before the ultrasound era, during our residency days, hysterosalpingography was the most common imaging technique used for diagnosis of PID. Findings suggestive of PID on a CT scan are obliteration of pelvic fat planes, thickening of facial plates, fluid-filled tubular structure in the adnexa that is hydrosalpings or a mass in the adnexa such as a tubo or an abscess. Findings suggestive of PID on a MRI plate are fluid-filled tubes, thickened tubes, enlarged ovaries, ill-defined ovarian margins, thick-walled masses which are tubo or an abscess and presence of free fluid in the pouch of Douglas. CDC has defined the following diagnostic criteria for acute PID. Minimal criteria Pelvic or lower abdominal pain in sexually active women accompanied by one or more of the following on bimanual examination in the absence of another identifiable cause. Cervical motion tenderness or uterine tenderness or adnexal tenderness. Supportive findings to improve specificity include any one of the following fever greater than 38.3 degrees Celsius, mucopurulent cervical or vaginal discharge greater than 5 WCs per oil immersion field from endocervical discharge, ESR greater than 15 mm per hour or C reactive protein greater than 1, gonorrhea or chlamydia positive endoservice culture, and inflammatory mass on bimanual examination. I will discuss the treatment in three parts. Prevention, treatment of acute pelvic inflammatory disease and lastly treatment of chronic pelvic inflammatory disease. I will first talk about prevention of PID. Patient education is very important since many cases of pelvic inflammatory disease are subclinical. It should focus on methods of preventing sexually transmitted infections and PID. This involves the following measures. Adolescents should be advised to delay the onset of sexual activity until age 16 years or older. Reducing the number of sexual partners. Avoiding unsafe sexual practices. Routinely using appropriate barrier protection such as male or female condoms. Treatment of patient as well as her sexual partners. Education of younger generation using social media will go a long way in achieving this goal. 
aims of treatment are relief from acute symptoms eradication of current infection and decrease in long term sequelae of pid the primary treatment of acute pid is medical antibiotic regimens for pid must be effective against chlamydia trachomatis and neisseria gonorrhoeae as well as against gram negative facultative organisms anaerobes and streptococci cdc recommends different antibiotic regimens for outpatient treatment and for inpatient treatment most patients with acute pid are managed as outpatients the cdc lists two currently accepted treatment regimens regimen a consists of the following ceftriaxone 250 mg intramuscularly once as a single dose plus doxycycline 100 mg orally twice daily for 14 days metronidazole 500 mg orally twice daily for 14 days can be added if there is evidence or suspicion of vaginitis or if the patient underwent gynecological instrumentation in the preceding 2 to 3 weeks regimen b consists of the following cefoxetin 2 g intramuscularly once as a single dose concurrently with probenecid 1 g orally in a single dose or another single dose parenteral third generation cephalosporin for example ceftriaxone cefotaxime plus doxycycline 100 mg orally twice daily for 14 days metronidazole 500 mg orally twice daily for 14 days can be added if there is evidence or suspicion of vaginitis or if the patient underwent gynecological instrumentation in the preceding 2 to 3 weeks besides the above regimens azithromycin 2 g single dose along with metronidazole regimen is commonly used to treat mild to moderate pelvic inflammatory disease especially in india some patients with acute pid require hospitalization indications where inpatient treatment is required are uncertain diagnosis failure to improve clinically after 72 hours of outpatient therapy pelvic abscess diagnosed on ultrasonography pregnancy inability to tolerate outpatient oral antibiotic regimen severe illness and immunodeficiency for example patients with hiv infection who have low cd4 counts or patients who are using immunosuppressive medications for inpatient treatment also the cdc lists two currently accepted treatment regimens again labeled as a and b regimen a consists of the following cefoxetin 2 g intravenously every 6 hours or cefotetan 2 g intravenously every 12 hours plus doxycycline 100 mg orally or intravenously every 12 hours this regimen is continued for 24 hours after patient remains clinically improved after which doxycycline 100 mg is given orally twice daily for a total of 14 days if a tubo ovarian abscess is present clindamycin or metronidazole are added along with doxycycline for more effective anaerobic coverage regimen b consists of the following clindamycin 900 mg intravenously every 8 hours plus gentamicin intravenously in a loading dose of 2 mg per kg followed by a maintenance dose of 1.5 mg per kg every 8 hours An alternative parenteral regimen is ampicillin sulbactam 3 g intravenously every 6 hours in conjunction with doxycycline 100 mg orally or intravenously every 12 hours. Patients on intravenous PID regimen can be transitioned to oral antibiotics 24 hours after clinical improvement. They should be continued for a total of 14 days. Oral therapy usually involves use of doxycycline. However, azithromycin can also be used. 
no differences in outcome were identified between inpatient and outpatient management in a large randomized multicentral clinical study that compared inpatient and outpatient oral and parenteral antibiotic regimens in the documented elimination of endometrial and tubal infection empirical antibiotic treatment is also recommended for sexually active young women with otherwise unexplained lower abdominal pain and uterine or adnexal tenderness and cervical motion tenderness according to guidelines from centers for disease control and prevention that is cdc atlanta organisms that should be covered by empirical treatment of pelvic inflammatory disease are chlamydia trachomatis neisseria gonorrhoeae gram negative facultative organisms anaerobes and streptococci during and after medical treatment women should be counseled to abstain from sexual activity or educated to use a barrier protection strictly and appropriately until their symptoms have fully abated and they have completed their antibiotic regimen the woman's sexual partner should also be treated for sexually transmitted infections if necessary therapy with antibiotics alone is successful in 33 to 75% of cases if surgical treatment is warranted the current trend is towards conservation of reproductive potential with simple drainage adhesiolysis and copious irrigation or unilateral adnexectomy if possible further surgical therapy is needed in 15 to 20% of cases so managed for patients who have developed a tubo ovarian abscess therapy should include injectable clindamycin or metronidazole that is anaerobic coverage and gentamicin for gram negative coverage all patients should be reevaluated in 72 hours for evidence of clinical improvement and compliance with their antibiotic regimen percutaneous drainage or exploratory laparotomy may be required if there is no response in 72 hours lastly i will talk in brief about treatment of chronic pid basically it involves surgical treatment of the long term sequelae of the disease that is tubal reconstructive surgery for blocked tubes leading to infertility ectopic pregnancy requires operative laparoscopy or laparotomy with conservative management of the adnexe chronic tumors in a peri or post menopausal woman not responding to medical treatment requires unilateral salpingo oophorectomy or hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy as the case may be dense pelvic adhesions may render surgery difficult in chronic pid cases This is the end of part 2 of my e-lecture on pelvic inflammatory disease. For further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology, refer to following books written by me. Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology Modern Obstetrics modern gynecology clinical cases in obstetrics questions and answers clinical cases in gynecology questions and answers and pelvic reconstructive surgery If you have found this video useful and informative please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here